The migrant crisis is not expected to be nearly as expensive as what Denver said when it went looking for federal money. It does feel like a turning point for us. The city is increasingly going to rely on grassroots efforts to help arriving migrants, and those are going strong. Farmers acknowledge they use most of Colorado's water. Tonight, they make their argument that their work is worth it and that they can conserve. There's a community trying to raise money for a memorial to a young man who gave his life to stop a school shooter. I was thinking maybe we could just take care of that together. Because when there's a need in Colorado, we don't just watch. Because this is next. Denver is drastically scaling back projections on what it will spend to help migrants this year. Fewer migrants are coming. Fewer services will be offered. Denver's worst case scenario of spending $180 million has been cut by a third. Our team covering the migrant crisis, Angeline McCall and Mark Salinger, are here for a deeper dive into what this means, the city's plans, and how citizens are stepping up to help. First, the city's new scenario based on new projections. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. In the middle of a crisis, numbers matter. $180 million is the number we've all talked about for weeks. A big number. The Denver thought the migrant crisis could cost the city this year. Now, that's changing. The $180 million deficit that we were facing is now closer to $120 million. Mayor Mike Johnson announced today the city now projects to spend $60 million less than the number that made headlines across the country. Far fewer migrants are now arriving here. The city will also close hotel shelters and focus on case management to get people jobs and housing. We will, over the next month, close four of our migrant shelters. We will close one of those a week over the next four weeks. And those actions will result in saving the city up to $60 million of costs. That's a claim that deserves some context. $60 million is a lot of money. In fact, Denver has only spent $58 million on migrants since the first people started arriving here in December of 2022. Johnston still projects Denver will spend double that amount this year, and projections can change quickly, just like they did today. We are optimistic. We're proud of the work that we've done. We're ready to get back to work on the stage ahead. Thank you so much for being here. So even with the city cutting this projected budget by a third, it's still $120 million that they need to find. Kyle, that's if projections hold. How much has the city come up with so far for this? We're looking at about $30 million, million or so. We know that there was about $10 million in reserve fund, $15 million from another project that was redirected, about $5 million from Parks and Rec, as well as the DMV. Angeline McCall, Denver's increasingly counting on nonprofits and private citizens to fill the gaps, and that's happening in significant ways. Yeah, significant. And when we say dramatic, I mean, we really mean that we've seen people step up just in the last 12 weeks. And I spoke with one group from one of the moms groups here in North Denver who have really been at it since the since the fall. Um, all right. So we have some tents. A she shed previously used as an office is now a storage space for items for and migrants. A lot of resalvaged um, sleeping bags and uh, sleeping pads so that people could stay warm outside. Jennifer Kettering began helping with Highland moms and neighbors in November. A large portion is resource navigation, so I'm pretty active as an admin on that page, trying to connect people to each other. Since beginning their efforts in November, the group has had over 10,000 volunteers and over 36,000 volunteer hours in 12 weeks. That's an incredible impact that I don't think we can ever know or measure. They've served more than 60,000 meals, and right now, more than 400 migrant families are in host homes within the North Denver community, thanks to the group. Essentially, we're tapping into the privilege of thousands of people who are lucky enough to be born citizens here. And so one thing I want to say, and I was thinking about this a lot, like, it's really important to me when we talk about what our group has been able to do, that we talk about the fact that we aren't being heroes, we're being humans with privilege, and we're dispersing that privilege in a more equitable way. With the city announcing changes to their resources, the expectation may mean community has to step up even more. I do think the responsibility is likely to fall on community, and that's how we've seen it fall out thus far. The group says that the city has previously reached out to them asking for additional case management to help when it comes to migrants, find housing and whatnot when it comes to things outside of shelter. And so that's something that the mayor brought up 
just this morning in his mm -hmm. press conference, which means that not only are they looking to do things too, but the city is trying to fill that gap with that citizen help. So you've got those hundreds, if not thousands of people dedicating a lot of their time and effort to helping migrants. Mark, you've also been tracking some of the financial support that's come in from private individuals. Yes, yeah, new, the Newcomers Fund, which is kind of the main fund that everybody knows about, they have continued to see a lot of donations. That's some good news. People are still wanting to help. We, we should acknowledge we've also raised for that fund through Next Word of Thanks campaign a couple of times, uh, and that is work that continues on the private side. Mark, Angeline. Thank you very much. The mayor of Monument is apologizing today for spreading misinformation about migrants on Fox News. Migrants from Denver are not being transported to Canyon City, despite the fact that that was claimed on Fox News Channel by the mayor of Monument, Mitch Lekind. He said this morning that he should have checked on that info before he shared it on national television. If he had, he would have learned what we did, that it was third hand. From the mayor of Canyon City, who heard it from a citizen who was passing around a three-month-old photo of a white van next to a park. Canyon City, tell our, uh, Canyon City police tell our partners at KRDO that photo is actually from an incident late last year that did not in any way involve migrants. Colorado could become the first state in the country to require in-person voting for people who are incarcerated. That would be the plan under a bill introduced by Democrats at the state capitol today. Inmates in Denver's jail already have in-person voting. In fact, some of them were casting their primary ballots this morning. Everybody has the right to vote that's eligible to vote. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are, um, you know, outside of the jail or in custody. The Constitution doesn't make that exception. It's my hope that some of these other counties follow suit. Some do, and some are very lukewarm about it. In Colorado, people can vote while incarcerated for a misdemeanor, but not while serving time for a felony. They have to wait until after that sentence. For nine years now, Denver has offered voter registration and election information and even in-person voting for people in jail. Right now, state law requires that mail-in voting be available for people who are awaiting trial or serving a sentence on a misdemeanor conviction. Democrats want the other counties besides Denver to be required to adopt the part of Denver's model that includes at least one day of in-person voting. Denver clerk and recorder Paul Lopez told us that the voter participation rate among the incarcerated is often higher than the general population. We spoke today with some first-time voters. I think it's important for people to vote and to understand what's going on in our community. They put Trump on the ballot, and uh, he's a felon, so I had to vote for a felon, so, you know, I'm a felon. There's a little bit to unpack there. Um, prior, again, prior felony conviction uh, does not bar somebody from voting only if they're serving time for the felony. The voter you heard from there is in on something else. As for Donald Trump, he's not a convicted felon at this point. He's charged with felonies in four different cases. We remember heroes. We record their stories. We mark their deeds so that everyone knows what they did. Kendrick Castillo was a Colorado hero. That 18-year-old gave his life when he rushed a school shooter at STEM School Highlands Ranch in 2019. Every one of his classmates survived that day, in no small part because of Kendrick's actions. His community now wants to mark his deeds and remember his story with a, re with a memorial and a park that he visited as a child. His family is preparing to lead a fundraising effort for that. But I was thinking maybe instead, we together as a next community could just cover the cost. This week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign will fund the Kendrick Castillo Memorial in Civic Green Park. As a lasting tribute to Kendrick's bravery and heroism, the plan is to install a tall basalt pillar and a plaque telling the story in a park near his school. Thought is that's probably going to cost twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. I'm thinking that there's a good chance that we could cover that cost together. So what we've arranged is that any additional money that we put together will be used to start the Kendrick Castillo Memorial Scholarship, which his family anticipates will be used for students involved in robotics, which Kendrick loved. A memorial in the park where he spent time as a child, and a scholarship to help students pursue the passion of his young life cut short seem like pretty worthy tributes to a young man who saved the lives of his classmates. 
Scan that QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get the link to donate. You know I'm never going to ask you to give to a cause that I don't support myself, and you have proven that even $5 helps. So as always, I'll match the first 50 donations of $5 to get us rolling. More than 1,500 of you have signed up to simplify your giving with a monthly donation to the Word of Thanks Fund. You put in your information once, and your donation will be split among every nonprofit that we support together, like the Kendrick Castillo Memorial and Scholarship. Use that same QR code or text to get there. The food that is grown, it affects the cost that everybody pays at the grocery store. From farm to table, a shrink in Colorado River has deep impacts on the agriculture industry. RTD says part of its downtown Denver service needs a complete redo. Downtown Denver is about to figure, just, to figure out just how much it relies on RTD light rail because a whole lot of that service is going to be shut down for months this year. Today, RTD announced a $152 million reconstruction of their light rail tracks. It means that starting in late May, all D&H trains will be rerouted to Union Station. L-Line trains, which connect the 30th and Downing Station to the downtown loop, those trains will be suspended. There will be no light rail service in RTD's central corridor May through September. What a beautiful day, Kyle. Weather whiplash. Yesterday we had the snow, we had the cold, we had the wind, we had temperatures in the 20s. Today, sunshine and 50s. We've got a mild dry evening coming up, an even warmer Thursday, but there is another storm on the horizon. Time just in time for the weekend, wouldn't you know it. There is a storm system to the south that's going to bring some beneficial rain to Texas, where they're battling multiple wildfires today. And we're also tracking a system moving on shore in the Pacific Northwest. Between these two, winds out of the south will move move our numbers even warmer tomorrow, still in the mid 50s this hour, and we'll go into the 60s tomorrow, but the winds will also be ramping up across the front range foothills and some of the higher pass areas. We stay dry for the next 72 hours, but there is a system waiting in the wings to bring us some cooler weather and maybe some rain snow late in the weekend, but not tonight and not tomorrow. Beautiful temperature trend leading into the evening and temperatures go above average for Thursday, Friday and Saturday, cooler Sunday with a quick blast of rain and snow, and then wonderful weather for the first full week of March, sunshine and 50s from Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week. I think maybe I'm going to survive, maybe make it through the end, but I don't know if my son will be able to. Western Slope farmers know that family traditions are challenged by dropping water levels in the Colorado. They tell us how they're preparing to make do with less. Next. All right, pop quiz. What percentage of Colorado River water usage in our state goes to agriculture? I would have guessed like 50%, and I would have been very wrong, because farmers, ranchers, and other ag users make up 90% of that Colorado River water. Our Brian Wendland introduces us to a fifth-generation farmer on the Western Slope who's trying to balance conservation, tradition, and their work feeding the rest of us. On Colorado's western slope, agriculture is king. That's why the west was settled, was agriculture. Tiny little seed. Troy Waters is a fifth generation farmer in Fruta. As the southwest gets drier, he worries the family business might not make it to a sixth. I think maybe I'm going to survive, maybe make it through the end, but I don't know if my son will be able to. Troy's been growing drought resistant crops long before water conservation was in the mainstream. His cash crop is alfalfa grown for seed, which uses way less water than its counterpart grown to feed animals. When they first started talking about demand management and everything, I said, shoot, somebody ought to subsidize me for raising alfalfa seed. I've been conserving water for the last 20 some years. He wants to use even less water now. Troy's just started experimenting with Camelina. There's two major companies. One of them's backed by ExxonMobil and the other one's backed by Shell Oil that are looking in to start making uh, fuel out of this crop. Jet fuel, to be specific. Troy says Camelina uses a third of the water most crops on the western slope need. You could plant it in the fall, irrigate it one time. If we had a winter like we had this winter, you probably may not even irrigate it in the spring. There is a problem with this new crop, though. Despite the green energy benefits, the government isn't subsidizing it like corn or soybeans. We're trying to save water, and maybe it's a crop that we can keep raising out west uh, 
stay in business for me. Right now, um, we have 1,630 CFS going into the diversion canal. Tina Bergenzini makes sure Troy and other farmers in the Grand Valley get their water. She's the Grand Valley Water Users Association's general manager. We have a 55 mile long uh, canal. It's the Government Highline Canal. It's a direct diversion from the Colorado River. The association provides water to just over 24,000 acres of Grand Valley farmland. It encourages farmers to plant drought resistant crops and work with what the river can provide. I would really like our urban neighbors to understand that um, we really care deeply about the river, about the environment, the inhabitants of our river, and the sustainability of the river. Still, it'd be easy to blame agriculture for the situation we're in on the Colorado River. Domestic use doesn't even make up 10% of the state's water consumption. 90% of the state's water goes to agriculture. The rest is used by industry. It affects the food that is grown. It affects the cost that everybody pays at the grocery store for that food. You know, it's there, there's a lot of effects to not managing the river properly. And so, yeah, you know, farmers, they grow food, but they, they care deeply about the source. I know we got the majority of the water and we're using the majority of the water. We're also feeding this nation. The only way this is gonna work is we all do it together. If we don't work together, Troy worries, it's only a matter of time before the government steps in. I'm afraid that what's gonna happen is Demand management, system conservation, whatever you want to call it, is the first step to buy and dry. Because at the end of the day, water follows money. And if that happens, water bills go up, food becomes more expensive, and this fifth generation farmer won't be able to pass his passion onto a sixth. I don't know what's gonna happen. It, it's scary. It's flat out scary. I, I know one thing, I'm gonna stay in the battle and keep fighting and try to keep agriculture alive out west, but we'll see what happens. Beautiful part of our state with a lot of hardworking people who care a lot. Poor journalist Brian Wenlands telling the story of the ongoing Colorado River negotiations from a number of angles. Tonight at 10 o'clock, we hear from a researcher at DU who knows firsthand how a real collective effort can stave off a water disaster. So I am told they have crashed the fundraising website for Word of Thanks. How many texts? Hundreds. hundreds, hundreds of texts. I'm sorry. Hey, listen, thank you for your generosity. Please be patient. We'll have the QR code and text number to give again to build the Kendrick Memorial Memorial and start a scholarship. What's your feedback next? So your exceptional generosity is crashing the fundraising website to build the Kendrick Castillo Memorial and to start a robotics scholarship in the name of that young man who gave his life stopping a school shooter in Highlands Ranch in 2019. I thank everybody who's trying to give right now. I beg you for patience. It's been a couple of years since we crashed a fundraising website. It means that a lot of you are looking to help make this happen. Uh, the folks at the Douglas County Community Foundation are aware of the issue. They tell me that they're working on getting that site up and fixed. I'm gonna give you the information again. Our Word of Thanks microgiving campaign is gonna to be to build a memorial to Kendrick's heroism at Civic Green Park and Highlands Ranch, and then any leftover funds will help to start a robotics scholarship. You can scan that QR code on your screen to get the link or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491. Maybe try the text if you don't usually do that because that link will stay there in your text all night long. You can check it any time and you can also sign up to give monthly for the Word of Thanks Fund. You'll find the links on our social media as well. Maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow night as well.